New York City, 1917. Americans get their music from player pianos. Tupperware doesn't exist because plastic was just barely invented. And most teenagers, about 75% of them, didn't go to school. But in a packed courtroom, a woman named Emma Goldman is on trial. And she's talking about whether or not it's patriotic to sit during the national anthem. The more things change, the more they stay the same, am I right? This is American Descent, a podcast from With Good Reason and James Madison's Montpelier about pushing back in the pursuit of a better America. I'm Kelly Libby. Emma Goldman might not be a name you know, but in the early 20th century, people had heard of her. Um, Emma Goldman is someone who comes up in a lot of free speech cases in this time. This is Sarah Mayu. She teaches at Vanderbilt Law School in Nashville. And I teach classes about constitutional law and legal history. Emma Goldman's story does not have a happy ending. So she is born in what at the time is Imperial Russia. In a place that's now Lithuania. And she emigrates to the United States in the 1880s as a teenager. And she quickly becomes very active in the anarchist movement in the United States and other radical causes. She published an anarchist journal and organized rallies and gave speeches railing against capitalism and made the case for birth control and freedom of speech. So just a number of the hot button issues of the time. It was this last one that landed her in the courtroom. But before we get there, we need a little context. So the early 20th century is a time when there's a lot of change going on in how Americans think about the First Amendment as well as free speech more generally. The First Amendment had been part of the Constitution since essentially the beginning. But it didn't always offer the same protections it does now. There just aren't that many First Amendment cases that go to court before the 20th century. People aren't thinking of it necessarily as something that you can go enforce in court. When free speech issues did come up through the courts, generally the government won. And they will often say, well, the government can actually punish or regulate speech you know, if it's obscene or disruptive or it has kind of a, quote, bad tendency or a tendency to incite violence. And the definition of obscene or disruptive or has a tendency to incite violence was pretty broad. But this started to change, helped along by the powder keg of World War I. So World War I starts in 1914 in Europe, and the United States only enters the war in 1917. And it's very controversial You know, there's a lot of debate about whether the United States should be getting involved in this. And so the federal government has a really one of the first modern propaganda campaigns, basically, to try to get public opinion in support of the war effort. One important reason for the propaganda campaign. This is the first time that the United States decides that it might start conscripting people against their will to join the army, which it hadn't done historically. The government was worried about people turning against the war and against the draft. Anyone that is seen as interfering with the war effort or kind of turning people against the war effort is going to be frightening from the perspective of the government. Congress actually enacts a series of laws that criminalize interfering with the military draft, uh, that criminalize publishing anything that's disloyal to the United States or speaking favorably about Uh, America's enemies. Some states were even criminalizing what they saw as threatening expression. You even have some states that try to prohibit people from speaking German or even playing German music. So in the context of the war, there is a lot of efforts by both the federal government and the state governments to control expression and to kind of crack down on anything that's seen as kind of interfering with the war effort. As the government cracked down on free speech, dissenters ramped up their efforts. For instance, there's a magazine in New York called The Masses Magazine, which is a socialist magazine. And so they publish letters from men in England who had been conscientious objectors to the war and refused to serve in the army in England and were therefore imprisoned for that. Um, And they write these letters to Americans that basically say, you know, if you don't believe in the war, you shouldn't fight in it and that you should kind of stay strong and object and refuse to serve in the army. 
In response, the post office refused to deliver the magazine. He says, you're basically publishing sedition. You're inciting people to rebel against the government, and that's illegal. Therefore, we're not allowed to distribute your magazine, basically. Meanwhile, Emma Goldman was speaking out loudly against the war and against the draft. And then she was arrested and charged with conspiracy to, quote, induce persons not to register, unquote, which lands us back in the courtroom. While she's on trial in 1917, she gives this very interesting speech about the definition of patriotism. And she she basically argues that it's not patriotic to simply blindly line up behind the military. It's not patriotic to never criticize the government. Goldman argued that she's the real patriot. She says, I love America, but you have to love America with open eyes, and that the true patriots are people who are willing to criticize the country and try to make it better. That dissent is actually patriotic, and that if you love your country, you should be willing to criticize it or to point out the ways that you think it's not living up to its principles. But the court disagreed. So in 1917, they finally convict her, essentially for interfering with the war effort because she's given a speech against the military draft. She served two years in prison. And then Emma Goldman, who said again and again that she loved the United States, was deported and sent back to the Soviet Union. But that's not the end of the story. Because the thing about dissent is that it spreads. In the years following, people like Emma Goldman kept standing up. And some of them started to win. The ACLU actually is established right around this time as well. So the ACLU becomes the organization that brings a lot of the major free speech cases of the 20th century. And they're founded right in this World War I and kind of post-World War I moment where, on the one hand, you have some of the most violent crackdowns on speech and on political dissent in American history, but you also have people fighting back and, and kind of the birth of the modern free speech movement. In the decades that followed, there were some growing pains. But slowly, a consensus emerged. Americans have the right to say what we want. But the Vietnam War and the protests against it put that belief to the test. In 1971, once again, Someone landed in the hot seat for speaking out against the draft. Which is a case called Cohen versus California. And in that case, you have a person who is criminally punished for wearing a leather jacket. And the leather jacket says on the back of it, F*** the draft. So he's walking around this courthouse, kind of a public space, and he's wearing this jacket that says, F*** the draft. And so he's obviously... You know, it's not the most eloquent wording, perhaps, but he's expressing pretty strong opposition to the military draft. And in that case, so the Supreme Court overturns his conviction and says he has the right to wear that and to express that view. The issue wasn't so much whether or not he could speak out against the draft. That was pretty much settled by the 1970s. It was the way he spoke out that bothered people. The issue in that case is whether you have the right to use the F word in public. So the court says, basically, you do have the right to kind of say whatever you want, that the government can't punish you just for using a bad word in public or just for saying something that's offensive to other people. Because not only do you have the right to express your political views, but you also have the right to decide how you want to express them. And it might be that using profanity is the only way you feel you can kind of get the full emotion of your view across. You know, Emma Goldman is basically exiled out of the United States for the rest of her life because she is criticizing the military draft during World War I. By the time of Vietnam, the Supreme Court is very clear that people have the constitutional right to express opposition to the military and also to do that even in ways that are offensive to other people. So would you say that the people of Emma Goldman's time moved the needle forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think they, you know, they did not prevail in their time necessarily, but they certainly introduced to American political culture this idea that 
The First Amendment has to protect not only mainstream views and not only polite political debate, but also that it has to protect basically the whole spectrum of political thought, even on the extreme ends of the spectrum, and that people should have the right to advocate for their views, even if their views are revolutionary or even if their views are pretty hostile to the existing power structure, to the existing government. So they kind of put that idea out there. They fight back when they're prosecuted and they make speeches and they write, you know, they publish things. And I do think, you know, even in those cases in the 1920s, you know, the Supreme Court is not unanimous. You do start to get some dissenting views even on the Supreme Court, where you have some justices who start developing a more capacious theory of what the First Amendment protects. And so it takes a while, but eventually, you know, the Supreme Court eventually does read the First Amendment to protect pretty much the whole spectrum of, of political speech. So I do think that that, that World War I and kind of post-war moment was very important in shaping the modern understanding of free speech, even though a lot of the people involved in those cases are punished at the time for what they're saying. Stories like Emma Goldman's and the religious dissenters of the founding era and our nation's civil rights heroes. What can high school students learn from these? We wanted to round out this series with a conversation about the place for dissent in the classroom. So we reached out to an expert. My name's Sarah Stitzlein. I'm a professor of education and affiliate faculty member in philosophy at the University of Cincinnati. She's also the author of Teaching for Dissent, Citizenship Education and Political Activism. My background's in political philosophy, so I ask the kinds of questions about What does it mean to be a good citizen? How do we make good citizens in our classrooms? How do we get students involved in political and civic life? Um, And I get the fun job of trying to convince kids and teenagers that politics matter, that power and political participation are important to each individual living in the United States. Dr. Stitzlein talked with Price Thomas of James Madison's Montpelier about dissent and education. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about teaching dissent? Sure. I wrote the book coming off of kind of an interesting period in our American history. I think we can kind of remember back, for those of us who were around shortly after 9-11, when we saw our country rallying together in response to the attacks. You know, we recall the the senator standing together on the steps of Capitol Hill singing God Bless America. And in the months and years right after that attack, we saw a lot of limitation on dissent. Um, There was a lot of public kickback for those who were questioning the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There was a lot of silencing of teachers who were challenging some of the things going on in our country at the time. And then Only a few short years later, we started to see the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Tea Party, and those movements brought a new spirit of dissent to the streets, to our town halls, to our social media. And yet in our classrooms, they weren't really keeping up. We were seeing teachers who were afraid to bring up controversial and contested topics like the war, like health care, like the economy in the classrooms. And so students found themselves in this weird position of looking out the door each day and seeing protest signs and reading about um, town hall meetings gone wild in their neighborhoods. And yet when they walked into their school doors, they didn't see that kind of democracy in action. And so I wrote the book as a response to that shifting climate of protest and dissent in our country. And I actually make a case there for why and how students should learn how to dissent, why it's important for democracy and how teachers should go about uh, teaching it. Can you very foundationally just tell me what is dissent? Well, um, typically to dissent is to openly disagree either with someone, a person in power, or with the consensus of a community. And then through robust and respectful argument, 
It entails putting forward an alternative. What should we do to change or alleviate or replace that problematic law or practice in our society? And in that vein, how do schools and particularly teachers and administration or maybe entire school systems, how are they misconstruing dissent and and the importance of it? Well, as things like social studies education have been on the chopping block in schools for some time now, as we've shifted toward math and English language arts, we find ourselves doing less and less of preparing students in civics education and and social studies and history, economics, philosophy, um, a lot of the skills of the humanities that enable one to be a good active citizen. So schools are kind of falling short of preparing those citizens who know how to dissent, who have the skills and the abilities to do so. The idea of dissent is certainly central to the founding of our country. Thomas Paine, who risked treason in order to express his dissenting views in our country, to folks like uh, Benjamin Harrison and Sam Adams, who were rallying masses around things like the Boston Tea Party and the Stamp Act, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison and John Jay, all writing about dissent as a part of a system of checks and balances that's going to keep our country strong and healthy by balancing power in good ways. Now, interestingly, all of those folks were writing about and engaging in practices of dissent at the founding of our country, and yet dissent itself doesn't make its way into our Constitution as an actual right. Um, Of course, it's tied to First Amendment rights of speech and assembly, but it itself is not um, a constitutional right. So the case that I make for why schools should be doing this grows out of seeing dissent as a civic right, uh, a right that comes about by virtue of being a citizen of the United States. So instead of the Constitution for a moment, let's take a look at the Declaration of Independence. A lot of us know the first line of the Declaration of Independence, the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But if you look at the very next line, you see Thomas Jefferson make a case for how our country should work on the consent of the governed. Our laws and our practices are just insofar as people give their consent to them. They agree to them. They honor them. They acknowledge that they're right and just. But when we find that those practices are no longer in agreement with us, that they're no longer seen as just or correct or good, that we have the right to express our dissent. So kind of the opposite of giving our consent, we, we express our dissent. And Jefferson goes so far in the Declaration of Independence to say we actually have a duty to do so when we encounter injustice. What I'm arguing is, is that if we have the right to dissent, we have this kind of corresponding right to be able to have the skills and abilities to know how to speak back if we disagree with our laws and our and those who govern us. So you, you spoke a little bit about the the difference between a constitutional right and a civil right. Where do these two rights, you know, where do these two paths overlap? Where do they diverge? And, and who is in charge of reconciling this gap? Well, sometimes it plays out in the courts. Um, We've had some major court decisions, uh, particularly about students and their right to dissent. So, of course, the most notable one being the Tinker decision. Uh, There were a brother, a sister, and a friend who decided to wear black armbands to school in protest and recognition of the war in Vietnam. And they were punished by their school for doing so. And their case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the courts decided that, indeed, students do not check their social and political opinions at the door, that instead they are entitled to bring those into the classroom and to express them within certain bounds, as long as they're not significantly disrupting from the opportunity for other kids in the classroom to be learning. They can share their opinions. They can um, pass out leaflets. So we see the court struggling with that distinction between constitutional rights and civil rights and recognizing that there's something important and significant about educational spaces as places for children to develop their civic prowess, their civic identity and their skills. You know, some of the most recent examples of this have been a a lot of the student protests, um, probably most notably in uh, in Florida, what, you know, what what were your reactions to the the coverage of these events and the student walkouts? I was pretty astounded. Um, first of all, by the sheer numbers to see um, on the the first walkout day, so a month after the Parkland shootings, 
The estimates were more than 200,000 children in about 3,000 schools nationwide walked out. Those are huge numbers. We haven't seen those kinds of numbers in school demonstrations possibly ever, certainly for years. That alone was significant to know that that many students were willing and ready to stand up to voice their themselves and to um, actually take action in their schools, and sometimes at considerable risk. I think one of the notable things coming out of that walkout demonstration was that some schools and some school administrators were not um, supportive. But I think the overall impact of those events was quite significant from students who rode buses and made their ways to state houses in order to call for gun reform to small things. Uh, One of the images that I remember most from that day was a press packet made on construction paper by 11-year-olds that was handed out to give the press insight into their experiences of violence in their schools, their suggestions for how it could change. And I thought, wow, what a remarkable thing for children to be doing together in pencil and construction paper to make a case to the media for for their concerns. What do you think about, you know, across the country, some of these schools were prevented from walking out. You know, some of these administrations, uh, you know, impose some some sort of after the fact consequences on these kids. I mean, you know, what do you think about that with regards to, again, schools being spaces for students to explore their their civic rights? I was quite troubled because I think those schools and those administrators, they failed to see the walkouts as an educational opportunity, as an opportunity to learn about the Constitution. So namely the Second Amendment, of course, as we talk about gun rights, but also the ability to invoke and practice skills of dissent. I thought this was a real shame because it lost out on a teachable moment to engage students in a, in a discussion of what citizens do when they disagree with those in power or when they have a concern they need to express. And such a conversation could have been had even without the school endorsing or taking a stand on the particular issue of gun legislation. I think some schools feared that by enabling or allowing the walkouts, it suggested that the school itself was taking a stand rather than that the school was taking a stand on behalf of students as budding citizens. So they missed out on a a true opportunity for learning. What do you think is a a way, a better way for schools to handle that, right? Because you do bring up a good point that they're caught in, potentially caught in in a little bit of a rock and hard place, right, with their their, um, responsibility to educate students, you know, but also, uh, you know, with, you know, allowing them, again, these these civic spaces. I mean, how would you recommend that that schools handle these type of events, which I assume will, will continue to happen and probably become, obviously, more widely publicized? Well, I want to be clear that I'm not saying that schools should require students to participate in protests or to take some kind of dissenting action. Rather, I'm saying that schools should provide students the know-how so that they can choose to participate in dissent if they feel it's warranted. In class, students should be learning some of the skills of dissent, things like consciousness raising, coalition building, uh, writing persuasively, public demonstrations, as well as kind of more traditional avenues for pursuing uh, legislative change through kind of traditional democratic routes. They should be learning how to discern when a protest is even warranted. Uh, when laws themselves are unjust, uh, when practices are problematic, so that they know how and when to speak out. So there's plenty of space for that to happen within the school, apart from actually even engaging in a walkout or protest. Do you think that the teachers and the schools and the systems, uh, what do you think their reasons were for preventing some of these, some of this dissenting action? And the part two of that is whatever those reasons may be or whatever you discern them to be, uh, do you think they're legitimate? Well, at the schools who were making headlines, at least, it was largely at the administrative level, superintendents and principals who are refusing the the walkouts. Um, the teachers' voices were not quite as, as notable in that. But we do hear from teachers is fear about engaging in politically loaded acts, um, fear that they might be seen as one-sided, that parents might complain that they are indoctrinating children. And I think that's when the focus is more on the content of what is the protest they're dissent about. And here, when we're talking about gun legislation, it's one that tends to be very politically divisive across parties. And so teachers are afraid sometimes of wandering into that kind of politically loaded territory. 
when we're talking more broadly about equipping students with historical information, you know, let's learn about the Second Amendment and understanding the purposes and roles behind it, how the Supreme Court has based decisions on it, um, and how it's played a role in the gun lobby and other things happening politically in capital uh, cities today across the country. I think if you make that kind of transition, you see teachers who are far more supportive and comfortable and willing to take on that sort of work. It's the more politically loaded space that some of the teachers were shying away from and as a result might not have felt comfortable endorsing during the walkouts. American Descent is a production of With Good Reason at Virginia Humanities and James Madison's Montpelier. Our artwork is by Carson McNamara, and our music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. With Good Reason's production team includes Elliot Majerzik, Cass Adair, and Allison Byrne. Our executive producer is Sarah McConnell. Our senior producer is Allison Quantz. Our intern is Adriana Gallo. We had engineering help from Jamal Milner. Special thanks to Price Thomas and Kendall Madigan at James Madison's Montpelier. And to Giles Morris, Lilia Fukin, Miranda Bennett, and our guests who shared their expertise. You can find the full series at montpelier.org. I'm Kelly Libby. Thanks for listening. 